Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first episode of, uh, or maybe our only episode, I'm not sure yet. We'll find out of HFES Australia coverage. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, as always. And also joining us today, we have Matteo Venzi on the line from Australia Down Under. Hello. Hey, there he is. How you doing, Matteo? Oh, g'day. <laughs> oh, not too, not too bad. It's a, a pretty cool morning uh, today, but hopefully it finds up pretty good. Good. Well, uh, how's the weather down in Australia? Because right now it's winter up here in San Diego. It's kind uh, of... Nice. Well, if you didn't know any better looking out the windows, you would say it's probably a wintry period, but we are officially technically in our summer, and I think yesterday it got to 37.5 degrees Celsius. All right, I can't recall what that is in Fahrenheit, but that's probably like up in the high 90s or something, I'm guessing. Wow, that's yeah, pretty toasty. All yeah, right. seriously. Yeah. Okay, so we're here to talk oh, we about... We were away yesterday. <laughs> so we're here to talk about HFES Australia, so um, uh, yes. Mateo... Let me just start by asking kind of what your experience with uh, previous conferences has been before. Well, in terms of, uh, I guess, the, the human factors and ergonomics space, I have had uh, no experience with any conferences until uh, HFESA. Uh, obviously, I started getting the awareness of that and HFES last year when I sort of stumbled on the podcast and was looking for more human factors uh, content. But, uh, yeah, as much as I would love to get to HFES, I, I just haven't uh, had the time and money for that yet. But it is definitely on the list, and I would love to join you guys over there one year. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, the opportunity came up for HFESA here in Perth, so I didn't have to travel anywhere. So that was uh, great. And I got to go for free as a student volunteer. So it all kind of worked out uh, pretty well. And I even attended the board meeting that we had over the weekend uh, before the conference because they wanted a local student representative, which is something they're trying to get on top of a bit more now to engage the sort of student demographic to really get people more interested in the whole field of uh, human factors. That's great. And we've seen a trend like that uh, here in America as well, where, um, you know, HFES executives, uh, higher ups will, will encourage, you know, people at all levels to get involved with the uh, discussion of human factors and how to improve basically uh, any processes within the organization. So that's, that's great to yep. hear that that's, that's worldwide. Um, so Mateo, just going through HFES Australia, what's the vibe like? Uh, what, what's the, uh, what does the whole conference feel like to you? Um, well, having not been to some of the other conferences previously, although having looked at w what some of the other conferences were, the, the conference here in Perth, it, it felt like it had a really sort of friendly, cozy vibe, but I'm just not sure as in terms of whether maybe it was just this particular year and that there wasn't sort of wider interest from um, outer field in other disciplines that wanted to get involved or that they already kind of just had in mind, all right, look, yep, we'll, we've got these speakers, yep, people on the committee have mentioned who they want to come along and then that was sort of it. So I'm, I'm not sure where some of the issues may have been with sort of not attracting a, a much wider audience. But, um, yeah, I guess some of that will come out in the debrief, uh, probably from feedback for the conference. But I felt it went well. You know, people were, were keen to talk about uh, what they were working on. Uh, we had um, the sort of student and uh, early career uh, group. We were trying to get them together to say, OK, yeah, right. So, you know, you're just starting out. You're a student. Right. Well, we've got this sort of special interest uh, community and uh, try and get them together and collaborating on some uh, new ideas. And, yeah, even the, the much older and wiser among uh, the crowd, you know, they, they were really happy to see that, you know, more younger people are coming through and really taking interest uh, in the field. That's great. So let's, uh, Blake, you were going to say something? Well, it's just interesting to hear that you were talking about that it was mainly a lot of people that are only from the human factors field. Was that what you were getting at? Because you mentioned that there was really, like, you expected to see people from kind of like a, a wider range, but you were only seeing them yeah. mainly from HF. Yeah, that's right. And it was actually probably more from, um, I mean, obviously, it's called the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, although uh, what I was kind of saying to people is that, well, ergonomics is you know, part of human factors. It's not its own sort of completely separate thing. And there was a lot of, I guess, you know, the sort of uh, 
physiotherapy type uh, backgrounds, occupational therapists. Uh, I mean, we had some uh, exhibitors there, which were you know mainly ergonomics. So you know, you had some desks, keyboards, all that sort of stuff. So I I sort of provided that as a bit of feedback, not as not as a negative, but just as a way to try and improve to say, well, look, if you want to try and actually get more people involved in the wider field of human factors, then you have to kind of be projecting that out that, yes, we are looking at all these different things across different disciplines. It's not just, okay, yeah, ergonomics kind of dominating the, the scene. Gotcha. And I think that's super important for a lot of organizations to hear, whether it's just human factors or if it's an ACM or if it's human factors mm-hmm. and ergonomic society. So that's, that's great that you're already kind of like getting that feedback out there and you were able to attend that board meeting over the weekend as well. Yeah, and we've uh, tried to revamp our social media presence as well uh, because obviously I guess the mo- most of the board, I mean, that, that they're not kind of from that generation where we've grown up with the internet and are on social media every day. You know, they've been trying to do a pretty good job, but there wasn't really anything that had been happening since uh, the conference that they had uh, last year in the Eastern States. So I said, look... Uh, I'm I'm glad I've got to come along to the board meeting and that, you know, you're letting me get involved. So, look, uh, let me help you get stuck into the social media and let's really kind of, you know, get keep the conversation going now because now they're already planning for uh, next year's conference, which is going to be in Canberra. And that's, that theme is sort of going to be about kind of future of work, transhumanism, you know, or, you know basically what's coming ahead. Whereas the theme for this year's conference here in Perth was about the many faces of human factors. So, okay, what a practitioner is doing in different areas. Like we had some aerospace, uh, submarine, um, rail control rooms, um, hospital design, prototyping. It, it was quite a good range. So even though it felt like what was possibly a smaller crowd compared to maybe some of the other conferences, it, there was still you know a good lot of meat to, to really chew through. Yeah, it's that's interesting to me that for the theme to be the many faces of human factors that, you know, sort of this ergonomics piece was so heavily kind of focused, right? I mean, that that seems counterintuitive to me, but um, I'm glad. Yeah, and I, I think some people interpret it differently as well. Like some people see ergonomics as still sort of wider human factors, but then when you sort of dig through it a bit deeper, you can tell, okay, it's still very much kind of, okay, office environment type stuff as opposed to, you know, I would have liked to have seen a bit more sort of um, user interface uh, type bits and pieces and, you know, maybe some focus on some specific technologies. And there was a little bit of that intermixed into some of the uh, presentations, but uh, there were a few where you could see that they were talking about the kind of processes that they went through, but then you were sort of thinking, oh, but but what did you actually sort of achieve on that project that you were working on? And some of it obviously was due to confidentiality that they couldn't talk about uh, with certain projects and others it was sort of just a little bit of a snippet and, yeah, it would have just been nice to elaborate on that a little bit more. But we only had three days and uh, I think each session was about sort of half an hour max, so sort of maybe about 25 minutes-ish and then about five minutes of questions uh, each time. But then we had keynote speakers each day as well, which um, sort of helped balance it out a bit too. So I, I just want to kind of go and walk through like what what the days were at HFESA and, yep. and what kind of things you found interesting and what talks you went to. Sure. And just tackle it that way. All righty, no worries. Well, uh, it all started on uh, Monday and uh, the talk that, I was really looking forward to when I first uh, saw the program uh, was from uh, Dr. Rochelle uh, Ornan. Uh, she's uh, from the Boeing company. So she's a senior design research lead uh, for advanced product development of cabin interiors. And uh, her keynote talk was about the aerospace cabin experience and passion, uh, passenger needs uh, for the future. So that, that, that was just a, an absolutely awesome talk and being a, an aviation guy as uh, you guys have obviously noticed with some of my contributions that that was like the icing on the cake i said right you know i, I don't care what else i see that these next few days that was like the, the thing for me so essentially what she kind of went through was the the history of of aviation kind of generally quickly and, and boeing's uh, part and all of that and uh, then I guess where where she has come from and her journey. And she's actually um, 
worked for NASA uh, before, uh, before coming to Boeing. So she's got kind of that space and aerospace um, side of things. And uh, she mentioned something about her personal motto, which I thought was quite good in the whole scheme of human factors. And that uh, she said it was about connecting people to meaning and magic. And that came back down to sort of how Boeing looks at designing their cabin interiors, where uh, she was mentioning something called the cabin ABCs. And uh, there essentially are um, A is airplanes for people, because uh, obviously we are designing them for people to fly in and travel around the world. Uh, B was by design. So everything in the cabin is intentional, even down to, uh, you know, the lighting shining off the food and the uniforms and how light bounces off the, um, uh, you know, your l luggage compartments. And then the third part was uh, basically uh, connecting people back to the sky. And that came down to sort of a lot of that is how you've probably seen in some of the new um, 787s and 777s where they've got the uh, internal lighting interiors where they can dim the lights and it looks like a starry night background. I think she was mentioning a... Um, uh, Norwegian or, or Swedish airline that um, had the Aurora Borealis uh, and then um, I think an, another moment where she said I think on their um, open sky type interior look a passenger actually uh, mentioned to a steward uh, can you actually close the, the roof before we take off because it was just that realistic uh, that's to the passenger that's, that's really cool <laughs> I have to say though, like that's that's really cool of Boeing to kind of consider not just the, you know, the what what are the words I'm looking for? Not just the point A to point B. They're actually thinking about the experience of yep. the person that is sitting there, and mm -hmm. if they could only figure out the center seats and the elbow rests, that then it'd be perfect. Yeah, <laughs> but, and she went into talking about things like the. Um, the seat pitch, which is the distance between the same point on one seat to the seat in front and how they've done things to sort of reduce the, the pitch uh, slightly and then reduce the size of um, your trays, but then you're still somehow getting a little bit more foot room and space. So a lot of these little subtle tricks that they've implemented to really make that experience um, better for passengers and um, things like their university partnerships that they have, uh, they also actually have a um, passenger experience research center. So I think uh, some people probably remember from uh, last episode about uh, the Canadian uh, research uh, center right. that's been set up, uh, the whole uh, journey mapping of the aviation experience. So Boeing has got something like that, but specific to their cabin interiors. So they'll bring in their airline um, customers through and basically get them to sort of sit in a, a simulated um uh, cabin mock-up and I think what uh, Rochelle said is they don't actually tell them what what they're looking for because they'll change it subtly from time to time and obviously depending on the, the customer they'll, they'll tailor it to their sort of type of look but they'll wait for them to then give them their feedback and say okay well you know um, how, how was the view or you know uh, how do you feel about the lighting I, I don't know the exact sort of questions that they ask but then trying not to obviously prompt them with any of those biases uh, beforehand to then help them obviously redesign uh, that experience in a more meaningful and uh, honest way for people that's pretty intense i'm glad that boeing's kind of tackling that though because i feel like that's something that's needed across because the canadian center sounded awesome because it's looking from end to end how does the yep. experience need to change or what maybe could be enhanced? But in this case, it's focusing on something very, very, you know, small in terms of it's just mm -hmm. one part of the journey, which is a big one. I mean, sitting yeah. on aircrafts is a big deal. Well, and I mean, the Canadian, oh, de definitely. The, the Canadian bit, too, that we talked about last week, that's even that that's government issued. That's that's trying to get government behind all of the aviation industry. And this is this is just kind of one slice of like how one company, Boeing specifically, does does things in house. So mm -hmm. that's excellent. Any other highlights from that panel? Uh, uh, yeah, so there was one, one other bit. Like in terms of her talk, it was not just obviously about Boeing, but she was talking about some disruption that has uh, come to the industry as well. And I don't have the name off the top of my head, although it might be in this other brochure because uh, we got to actually have a, a workshop with her on uh, the Wednesday about uh, sort of uh, 
disruptive technologies and um, sort of changing industries. And she mentioned something uh, with the airlines and that now there's uh, a new service that has come about where you can actually FedEx your luggage to your destination. What? So you don't have to go through the trouble of taking your luggage to the airport, the check-in process and everything else. So I think you, it sort of started from about $15 or so where you could uh, pay this company to have basically do that for you. And uh, I think it's mentioned in, in this document here, but I just didn't have it... Um, written down off the top of my head so I, I can put that up in the slack anyway because i've got a whole bunch of um companies that she mentioned uh, in our workshop that we had on the wednesday yeah really quickly mateo you mentioned slack i just want to let all of our listeners know this is the guy who posts everything in slack and he's been one of our most <laughs> avid slack users so thank you for doing that mateo um and, I, I try and i'm really thankful that our listeners can go and find some of the resources that you're going to share with them up there from hfes no australia worries. Uh, no problem. Yeah, so I'll, I could I can go through some of the other talks that uh, happened on the Monday, and I'll I'll mention if I went to any of them or any points that I um quickly remember. Sure. There were um so there were a few streams on the uh, Monday. There was uh, occupational health and safety, uh, human factors in the workplace, and then a fatigue accident investigation workshop. So that was sort of our our morning uh, session. And then the afternoon session ended up uh, being uh, safety management, personnel in the workplace, and a musculoskeletal disorder uh, workshop. So if I go back through that quickly and uh, see what did we have that would probably pique some people's interests here. So there was something that I walked in towards the end of, and I'm a little bit miffed that I missed it, but it was... Um, presentation in the human factors in the workplace stream and it was improving usability of an electrical maintenance control room so they were essentially looking at okay what alarms are showing up how are alarms viewed on the screens how is that whole process uh, being done in terms of acknowledging alarms and and processing them but yeah i only got in to the last um, couple minutes of that uh, unfortunately but uh, yeah it was really interesting to see i guess how they're looking at you know, even where people are sitting, the design of desks and how people are having to collaborate in that high stress environment where, you know, in some cases you are getting a lot of that auditory overload with you know, alarm sounds and visuals and how they can really redesign that to improve um, performance. So uh, I don't know if you guys have had any experience uh, with some of that uh, at all in some of your projects. Honestly, not in my projects directly. I know that a big thing that came up when I was doing some work with like cockpit design early on when I was like doing NASA research stuff, it was dealing with how how do you deal with so many alarms in the cockpit? And mm -hmm. it sounds similar at least in in that you've got auditory, you've got visual, and then also you've got the talking between a pilot and a co-pilot. Um, so I can only imagine that that was a really helpful talk for anybody in the industry. Yep. And uh, I think uh, the good thing as well is anyone that, that isn't in that industry, but you know, it, perhaps from health, healthcare and, and others where there was an article that I was just reading uh, yesterday, I'm not sure if I had shared it in uh, the Slack or not, but I'll do that later, was about um, redesigning um, alarms in healthcare, uh, obviously in the intensive care units. But uh, that, that's something I'll put up later because it, it is uh, quite, quite an interesting area that uh, does need a fair amount of attention. Um, there was uh, a couple then in, on the, um, oh, there was actually one on the rail uh, side. There was some, um, as practical issues and solutions for integrating human factors across five metro, uh, major metropolitan rail infrastructure projects. Unfortunately, it looks like I missed that one as well. Uh, there was just so much going on, and being that I was volunteering, I was kind of running around and helping out uh, with bits and pieces. But um, there's some more details of, of that uh, in the abstracts. So I'll move on to uh, the rest of where have we got here. Tuesday here. Uh, does go over the page a bit more. Ah, so we had uh, a bit more technology, transport, and um, an accessible technology uh, workshop. Uh, in terms of the uh, transport uh, stream, so uh, there was one in there about human factors in train control re room redesign, and it turned out to actually uh, be for our uh, local uh, railway here in Perth, although Apparently that was meant to be secret, but I um, guess the secret pretty quick when they talked about electric railways and we've only got one one here. 
But uh, without giving away too much, uh, that was essentially about uh, putting in a new position into the control room and how they were going to interact in terms of also being able to manage incidents. So they were in uh, another room, sort of next to the control room, and then, okay, how are we going to redesign the screens and the desk layouts so that they can both collaborate but still be interacting um, with the main control room appropriately. And I think they said they had 18 screens or something that they were dealing with. Oh, wow. Hey, Mateo, I was just going to ask for... I mean, I've seen pictures of the inside of a train... Uh, control room. Could you just kind of describe yep. for our listeners what that looks like? Sure. So it, in in most train control rooms, um, you'll uh, aside from obviously where the operators are, you'll have a a long um, a screen sort of at the front of the control room where you'll see the the whole uh, rail network uh, layout. So if anyone's ever seen any documentaries about like London Underground or, or any other places, uh, that's kind of a, a pretty much a standard thing for all um, train control centres. And then in front of that, you'll then start having separate desks. Depending on how large the network is, you'll have operators that are basically assigned to a section of the network or to one of the, the lines. In case of, um, for example, the London Underground, I think recently they've done um, or created a new control centre in an area called Hammersmith. And there was uh, there's a good YouTube uh, video about that, which I can share on Slack later. You got and that really coming. got into the nitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, there, there's a lot of material. So there were there was a lot of uh, issues there, I guess, about uh, if they had a square desk or with all the monitors that, that they have, you know, are they going to have blockages between people having to, you know, talk uh, between each other, and are they actually going to know what each operator is doing because there's uh, so many different crossover lines there. It's it's just crazy, and um, I think they opted for like a rounded uh, desk design so that you know, all you had to do was just turn your neck slightly and you had that full view of the other operators um, working with you in that particular um, space. So that that was sort of uh, one challenge. And I think that came out a little bit um, in this talk as well. But also that the fact that uh, there was a question that someone asked after about, well, why do they use so many screens and why are there so many different systems that they've got to interact with? And uh, I think some people were, were thinking, well, look, you know, why can't you just integrate that all, all into one? And it's not really that easy because a, a lot of the systems are quite proprietary. And uh, particularly when it comes to the actual control system for the railway, that's not the same system as what their radio system is. And then they're going to probably have their internal email and other stuff to communicate between, you know, people within the organisation. So being that I've actually worked in the control centre that we have uh, here in Perth, uh, I realise that, yeah, th that's still a fair way off to get that full ultimate uh, integration. But, I mean, even though there are all those separate systems, as long as it's designed properly with consultation of operators, then, you know, they're going to be minimising those problems. And they did mention the fact that th there's been, um, I think there was another similar talk as well, where they were using VR to obviously take operators into that control room uh, space beforehand and really Im immerse them in what it was going to look like and, and really d doing that stakeholder consultation, which I think was a, a big thing that came out of a lot of the talks and that I think uh, human factors practitioners really need to push the importance of human factors at the beginning of the design process because a lot of project managers and engineers and so on, they, they just don't really seem to understand sometimes just how important you know, that whole human factors and human centered design process is because it's really difficult to fix it up later on. Most definitely. I mean, that's something we see all over the place, right? When you end up on a project where you're maybe starting in the middle and if you had been there in the beginning, you might have been able to avoid the problem. Kind of like what you're talking about with the railway system where it's these mm -hmm. disparate systems that are put together that don't necessarily interact and it would cause a lot of like unhinging just to replace all of them right and that'd probably be roll out over time but something like vr yeah. or getting human factors people involved early in the process really is kind of our bread and butter right it's where we can mm -hmm. save the most time exactly yep the further left we can get to the process the better definitely so continuing on um that that sounded like uh, yep. a pretty interesting one, but going forward, what else did you go to? Was this, are we still on Monday or uh, are we Tuesday now? Uh, so that that was, that was kind of mo mostly Monday. R Rachel uh, also did a presentation. Uh, my my partner on her research, she's been doing with uh, um, for roads. Uh, although I guess without sort of seeing the presentation, it, it it might be a bit confusing for some people to undertake. But I took. Uh, 
or I participated in some of her research, and that was essentially about seeing uh, whether people would understand whether they could overtake or not, uh, depending on the width of, and the gaps between the centre lines in road marking. So that was that was quite interesting and something something different that sort of most of the people there probably might have never thought about unless they were in that sort of roads uh, environment. And uh, being that she was very new to the whole human factors scene as well, it was nice to to see her really engaging with other people and them taking an interest. So I, I think this is probably one thing that I would mention to anyone and a bit of a takeaway that even if you're not fully immersed in the whole scene of human factors, but you're you're doing something that is related. And I mean, at the end of the day, everything we're doing in, in, impacts humans in one way or another. So essentially everything is kind of human factors. Then, you know, just try and get along to some of these conferences and events and, and just, yeah, listen and participate because you never know what you might learn and, uh, you know, what new areas you might find uh, that are interesting when you really see this, these deep dives into the processes behind the thinking. I'm going to invite all my molecular bio uh, chemist friends to the next Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. They're going to be so excited. <laughs> Ergonomic beakers. No, but you bring up a great point that like a lot of the things, a lot of the different disciplines on this planet have to come back to the human. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that someone who may not, it's tangentially related. I think that's great to get them involved and to see how their impact or how their, how their research can impact uh, not only our field, but people. I think that's that's De great. Definitely, exactly. Um, so Tuesday, uh, leading on from there, uh, the keynote was um, a guy called uh, Jim Knowles. Now he's been involved in risk management and mining and uh, project management and so on for like about forty years, and it was uh, a bit of a different talk in terms of not so much about. Um, initially the design but it was an accident uh, that happened uh, at uh, Pike River uh, coal mine and this was uh, over in New Zealand if I recall and um, es essentially he was talking about the whole uh, thing of you know, what he calls the poker machine analogy or lining up the cherries with with failures uh, I guess you know most people probably know about the Swiss cheese or, or the shell model so he was talking about why this accident should never have happened uh, to begin with, and a lot of those human and organisational uh, factors that uh, led up to it. So, yeah, it was uh, quite an emotional um, uh, talk. And uh, I guess one thing that came out of that, without going into too many details, is that uh, when the mine essentially uh, blew out, it had, so methane was leaking, uh, there was an explosion, the mine got sealed up, but uh, all the workers that were down there did, didn't get out. I think two people in, in the end actually survived because they had actually um, gotten up to the surface earlier. But because of that, no actual accident investigation has been able to be conducted because people haven't wow. been able to go back into the mine and actually see, okay, well, did a piece of equipment fail or was something um, down there that shouldn't have been down there or was it a human error? So uh, now with a change in government in New Zealand, they've set up an organisation called the Pike River Recovery Agency and they're planning to actually reopen uh, the mine uh, next year to get down there and actually perform a, a proper forensic investigation. So that was really... Uh, cool for me as well from a safety point of view and and i mean i, I geek out on you know, engineering disasters and air crash investigation and all those shows because i think that's the one thing that some people don't always think about so much and that we look at the design of all these systems but then when things go wrong we, we've still got to go go then back to that again when it comes to the investigation it's not just you know safety experts we've got to bring in those human factors and ergonomics experts and all those other disciplines to really build up that picture of okay well what were they doing when i guess to coin the phrase when shit hit hit the fan so um yeah that was really interesting to to have a talk from that um safety uh, point of view and, and really you know get people thinking about the seriousness of their roles because if all those processes were in place to begin with if you know they hired the right people, if they had the right training, if they had the right systems for ventilation and other things, then any one of those things may have prevented that that failure from occurring. So that that was yeah pretty emotional from from that aspect, in, just in terms of how how badly it went, but just how easily it could have actually been prevented. Yeah, I I have to echo the same kind of thing when we were at HFES 
when Keith Fawcett was talking about the Alfaro, I think that was a very similar kind of experience where you just go down the list of all the things that happened um, mm-hmm. to, to, I use the metaphor, the perfect storm, right? Like it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking to kind of watch all these things and, and know that it was easily preventable because of human factors. Yep. Definitely. And uh, I think that's just, you know, one thing that, that people involved in the discipline, they, they just really should hold their heads high and that what, what they're doing, you know, not only makes things easier to use, but at, in, at the end of the day, done properly, then, you know, what we're doing saves lives. So, um, yeah, no, no, no one should ever think what they're doing in human factors is, is this distant thing from, you know, the end goal of, of people actually doing the work. It, it's, it's super important. And, yeah, I think the more people can realize that, the more people might get actually excited to really look at human factors as an area that they want to get into. So, yeah, I think if we can, if we can really get that excitement out there, that would be uh, really helpful in terms of getting more people through the door. Well, if you figure um, out the puzzle, let us know. We'll, we'll be happy to uh, well, or, or, bring them I, in. I, 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 I will keep you posted. <laughs> uh, so after that, um, on the Tuesday, the, the keynote, uh, the different streams that we had for t- uh, the day were uh, defense, organizational design, management. Uh, we had a few more workshops and uh, there was human performance. So I'll, I'll go over a few of them uh, quickly. Um one of them in the defence stream was actually with one of our uh, researchers from Curtin University, and the topic was exploring the human visual system in virtual reality head-mounted displays for submarine periscope image analysis. So what was being done there is they've created uh, some virtual I- images and, and so land- landscapes of the ocean to test the perception of, I guess, you know, distant um, boats and, and objects by using a, a 3D display. So, you know, Oculus, Vive and, and so forth. And I guess w- what they were trying to get at is um, it's related to the redesign of periscopes where instead of now having, I guess, you know, the traditional mirror prism type set up, you know, obviously having a camera and then using a 3D display to, to look, at, um, look at what's out there. Um, I uh, don't know if I've got too many notes on that here, but um, yeah, ba- basically it was just going through the process of um, seeing how how they could simulate that within the virtual environment, and then looking at all the issues with you know intraocular distances and your three D um, perceptual visions and so forth. So un- unfortunately, I didn't write down too much about that during the talk because I was taking some uh, pictures. For her because she's quite new to to the area but uh yeah i've got the abstract in there and i can probably get a few more details uh, from her to share with the group i know you guys especially nick yep. uh, would uh, <laughs> find that very interesting Nerd. in fact i have a couple follow-up questions was this was this purely training or was this like operational uh, uh for no so use? so it was i guess the goal is to lead on to what they're trying to do with redesigning submarine periscope systems. So this was essentially uh, trying to, I guess, build that into, you know, create some unity models to actually test uh, those theories of, you know, okay. if, if it would actually work better. And so they created some um, scenes where, okay, yep, you know, you could see the ocean, whatever, sort of had a little quick video in the presentation panning through. And then um, she said, oh, look, you know, did did you spot the object? And sort of ran it again. And it's like, oh, yeah, look, that, that tiny little little bloody ship in the distance there. And it was sort of, I guess, um, trying to say, okay, well, how difficult it is already for existing operators to really spot objects with the sea moving and everything else. But then sure. if we can you know, use these camera systems and get these 360 views. So I think they were talking about uh, the Insta360 uh, and um, a couple of others. Then, uh, you know, they, they could try and do some uh, testing on this to really see if these camera systems might actually provide some better benefits. So I think they were using uh, some NASA TLX um, system, the task load index, uh, to do some comparisons on that. But, yeah, I can get some more information on that because I didn't... Um, unfortunately write down a whole heap of notes yeah i i'd be definitely interested to follow up on that one <laughs> so I'll, I'll i'll definitely see what i can uh do on that f- uh for everyone um there was uh in the organizational stream a good one on a good work design 
So as uh, strategies to embed human-centered design in organizations. And I think that came down to really engaging uh, workers and staff within the organization to help come up with new ideas and better ways of uh, doing work. And I think the example that was mentioned at the beginning of that was uh, road workers where they're essentially putting down a tape on top of the asphalt that was uh, joining sections of the asphalt together where you've got, I guess, these little join lines. And they were essentially, one person would be walking, unrolling the tape, another person would be walking behind, rolling the tape up. And so um, this uh, lady went out there, she was uh, part of the consultancy process and sort of, you know, okay, she started doing the work and started having a conversation. And uh, they came up with a just a, a simple roller type uh, design, but it, it was interesting what she was saying in terms of, I guess, making sure you get these sort of cultural aspects and other things out of the workers and implement them into the design where I think um, the one big thing that came up was, oh, look, yep, this roller, great idea, but we need a stubby holder in it. And for anyone that doesn't know what a stubby holder is, it's just, you know, a can or the, you know, bottle um, holder insert uh, because they're out there working in, in the heat and, uh, you know, they obviously want to have uh, their cans of soft drink with them without having to actually hold it. So that that was like, okay, great, we'll, we'll use this roller, but put, put that drink holder in it and uh, it will just put the icing on the cake. So I, I think coming back to when we're designing these new systems, that it, it's not just about the actual work itself, but how are we creating that, you know, better environment for the actual persons while and really actually not just engaging them in the work, but uh, making them feel like it, it is a, you know, nice in environment or nice piece of equipment to actually be using. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, I really like that focus on the quality of life improvements that, that you can make for, you know, just, just any sort of uh, any occupation, really. Yeah, because it makes mm-hmm. work more enjoyable, right? Like if you have even just those little tiny things like being able to, you know, have your soft drink on you and not have to be carrying it around and just like small differences can have a giant impact on work quality. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me have a look here. What else do we have on Tuesday? I don't think I got to many more uh, in that particular session after, but let me just tease out something here. Ah, yes. This is one that I missed out on, but I should have gone to because you probably would have loved this, Nick. Uh, I was exploring the impact of augmented night vision systems on cognitive workload and situational awareness for dismounted soldiers. There you go. Rolls right off the tongue. And and I'm not sure why I I missed that session, but uh, looking back on it, it's like, damn, that would have been good. But um, I know we have the abstract for that, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and get some, some more information uh, on that for you. But, uh, yeah, that sounds like it would have been um, quite good to get to, unfortunately. Um, later in the afternoon, uh, we had uh, some more human performance uh, stuff. Uh, so w- one of them, I think... It, it didn't say defence, but it sounded like it was maybe a cross between defence and, and law enforcement, it, uh, and there was another one as well. So one of them was using inertial measurement units to determine human performance measures for weapons assessment, and then the one after that was driving under load, measuring driver instructor workload on a military heavy vehicle training course. Wow. Although... I didn't get to both of those because I was actually in a workshop on uh, how to prototype a new human machine interface for something that doesn't already exist in the market. So I figured, oh, okay, yep, really interesting topics, but the workshop just sounded like a bit more of the icing on the cake. Yeah, Matteo, can I just jump in and ask you kind of what your experience was trying to balance uh, not only um some of these conference presentations but other things at the conference that you wanted to go to like some of these workshops Mm -hmm. or or even networking events well in terms of uh networking there was uh we had like a bit of a breakout on uh the monday just between uh or sort of the second half of lunch where like our early career and um student group went and had a a zoom meeting with uh one of the people over east and uh they had some uh, professional development groups um, breaking off but it didn't work too great because it was within that one hour of lunch that we had so some people were still stuck thinking no nah, look i'm, I'm going to finish off my lunch before i get that or they just had forgotten about the notice earlier in the day so 
that didn't work out <laughs> extremely brilliantly, oh, but no. um, I'm, I'm sure some feedback for that will solve it uh, for the next conference. But there was a um, masquerade uh, ball and um, dinner, I think, on the Tuesday uh, night. Although, uh, yeah, the extra costs uh, to incur for that, uh, I, I didn't end up getting along to that. And I thought, oh, yeah, I think I'll keep my dancing skills uh, to myself <laughs> for now. So there, there wasn't uh, a whole lot of um, sort of inter-conference networking sessions, but we did have like morning tea break, lunch break, afternoon tea break. So there was sort of net networking amongst uh, participants sort of within those um uh, breakout times uh, but yeah in, in terms of oh sorry nick oh i was just gonna going ask to a, a follow-up question to that um how many yep. how many attendees roughly were at the conference um i i think roughly about 150 okay so it was pretty it, small it, it pretty was, intimate for you to connect with yeah some of these yeah other... it was we we basically had um sort of uh it was like a sort of a ballroom type area that we we had opened up for the the keynote speeches and then that got split in half for um the various uh, like the two sort of talk sessions and then there was like a boardroom area where we were having out the, the workshop uh, sessions so yeah that it was it was pretty cozy and you, you sort of um, i mean there wasn't any issues with trying to find where you need to go but it was more just a case of ah oh, okay there's three things on at the same time and like which one am i going to zigzag back and forth to so I, I just sort of teased out the ones that were a bit in, more in line with my kind of technical interests so like the rail ones stuck out prototyping disruptive tech yeah i went to all the keynotes because there was nothing on at the same time as those obviously they were they were on before our, our morning tea and, and the rest of the day got started so yeah i i guess if if i had one one bit of feedback for, for everything obviously it comes down to time and, and money and if there were more sponsors and everything else then it, it probably could have been you know made a five-day event maybe than a three-day event but also just people's schedules as well there was a lot of people that had come in from over east so some of them had to leave early on the wednesday to get flights <clears throat> excuse me to go back again so i guess it's just one of those logistical things so when you know a lot a lot of people a lot of the research and stuff is also particularly centered over east and a lot of the universities have a lot of human factors programs whereas here in western australia we're still slowly kind of catching up to that we've got organizational psychology we've got physiotherapy and other things so here in wa there tends to be more of that ergonomics and, and safety set whereas from the eastern states there's definitely a lot more sort of broader human factors uh, stuff going on hey mateo i just want to do a quick time check i know you're you're running tight uh, yeah it's a uh, quarter past nine so we can probably still carry on on to wednesday there's not a huge amount um left and yeah i i i should be fine okay so, so let's go ahead and uh, get into Wednesday. All right. So um, I'll just quickly mention like the workshop on, on the Tuesday before that. So that was a human uh, machine interface prototyping. So that was about um, one of the uh, participants who was here that is actually on, on the board as well from uh, Victoria. It was about coming up with a new device to actually um, lift uh, gas bottles for one of the large like, um, plumbing and gas um, uh, groups here in Australia and it was the the challenges with integrating it into the existing crane system and how they were going to just make it pretty much foolproof for people to just you know whack onto bottles pick them up and release it. it it was just i guess going through that whole process of the sort of engineering design thinking and human factors uh, process of how to really come up uh, with a product uh, design and going through that engagement process with the staff so that that was that was quite immersive and uh, really interesting we saw some of the the 3d printed early prototypes uh, of that so i'll see if i can um i think i've got some photos and, and stuff as well so i'll i'll shoot them an email and just say hey look you know is it okay if i share some of this stuff with um the podcast slack so i'll I'll get back to, to you guys on that. So, Mateo, how did you find the workshopping experience uh, for the conference this go? Uh, I, some people mentioned that some of the workshops felt more like just a talk than, than an interactive thing. Um, the one we had sort of on the Wednesday, again, with Rochelle, that was quite interactive. 
Um, the one we had on the Tuesday, that was a little bit interactive because I think at the end they got people to try and uh, design a mask for the masquerade ball, but the, they kind of said, oh, look, uh, we want you to design a AI facial recognition blocking apparatus. And essentially it was like, oh, okay, you want us to design a mask because people don't have a mask for the ball tonight. So <laughs> that, that was that was quite fun and, you know, they integrated a bit of humour and that into it. But, yeah, some of the other workshop sessions were were more just like a sort of condensed sort of talk than, sure. than an interactive type of thing. So, I mean, all, all these kinds of things, I'm, I'm sure they're going to work through all the feedback and, and look at how we can improve um, for next year's conference. But, I mean, there, there was nothing... There's nothing bad about anything, but obviously, you know, some some things could could have been done maybe slightly um, differently. Uh, we really have it here. So I guess I'll go on to Wednesday um, then, because uh, that's pretty much uh, then the last day of the conference. Um, the keynote that we had for Wednesday was um, Tim Massey. Now he, I've got some notes here for him because he was talking about the future of work. And uh, how I guess you know we've got the issues with uh, the aging population and um, new industries uh, disrupting things, so like industry 4.0, uh, automation, general technology disruption. So uh, he was basically, I guess, um, looking at okay, well, what are the issues that we're now facing in terms of uh, inequalities that are popping up with uh, people's work capacities and their jobs being eroded by um, you know automation in perhaps like warehouses for example like you look at amazon and some of the new warehouses they're building and you know how few people they're going to actually need but then the people that they do have in warehouses you know they're pretty much being slave driven for their work and you know almost like near minimum wage at times so it's i guess how we find that balance with with where we're going with technology and aging population moving forward so that was that was quite an involved uh, talk with some of the research he's been doing. And I think um, it was, he had put the call out for people to try and if they wanted to get interested in helping with some of that research. So I'll, I'll put some of that info up as well in case anyone's interested in that particular area. There might be some opportunities to provide some feedback or, or collaborate for anyone that's um, looking at the, the whole sort of broader future of work and aging population issues. Yeah, definitely. That seems like an area that's ripe for exploration uh, with a lot of, you know, everyone's always going to age all the time and automation's always going to get better. So that seems like a field where you could really flourish, I think, if you're if you're looking for an area of expertise, if, if you're fairly new to the field. Or if you're looking for a thesis topic, that sounds like a good place to go. There oh, you go. De de definitely. And he was, he was talking about... Um, you know, pe people that are telecommuting and, and you now all these different new ways of working and how we can still keep them engaged and, you know, the issues with social isolation if you're working from home remotely. And so, yeah, there, there's so much you can un unpack from that. It was it was really interesting. Um, so the sessions that we then, or the streams we then had on Wednesday was uh, ergonomics in design, a symposium on sitting and standing, um, healthcare, medical services, tech design, human-computer interaction, and uh, then a couple more workshops. So I'll quickly just go over a, a few before I probably have to make my way out the door. Um, let's have a look here. So there was one that unfortunately I missed. Um, oh, well, a, a couple here in the ergonomics in design. Uh, one was analysis uh, of Australian research of usability testing of medical devices and procedures. Oh, there you go. So I think uh, there was something either in the last episode or episode before about, you know, hospitals using VR a lot more now to try and practice uh, surgical procedures and even in the design of devices, trying to use them in a VR um, context first. So I don't uh, know all the content of that talk off the top of my head, but uh, I can get it out from the abstract and, and share it in Slack. But that was one that I did um, target. But on the same time, there was a talk about opening a new hospital and the benefit of hindsight in terms of what worked well and what didn't. And uh, that probably piqued my interest slightly more because I've been on some tours of um, our, one of our brand new hospitals during the early phases of construction and where they had mock-up wards and then later on when we were looking at all the IT issues and things. So 
it was interesting to see uh, what challenges this hospital in South Australia had in terms of, oh, look, you know, you've, you've got uh, perhaps the crane for, I think, the bariatric or overweight uh, patients and, okay, the, the lift to lift them up, yep, it will take them out of the bed and it will take them just through the toilet door, but it wouldn't actually extend over to the toilet. So you're thinking, oh, okay, well, like, who, who designed this then? Like, why is that part missing? All, all these little subtle issues that, I guess, from engineering point of view, they think, oh, well, look, we've, we've got the person into the bathroom now. What, what's, what's the problem? But then from the actual, you know, output for, for the hospital and the patient, it's like, well, yeah, we actually do need to get them over the toilet to be able to sit on the toilet. Like that's, so things like that that came out of um, that presentation in terms of just re really really awful or, or silly sort of design mistakes that they had to continually keep change, uh, chasing up because either, you know, Chinese whispers or something got lost in translation with engineering and, and so forth. And, and that really just brings it back to the fact of, you know, getting design right at the beginning because the, the costs involved as well to fix this stuff up later can, can be astronomical. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really important to get things down before design is implemented. Make sure, you know, you, you can save a lot. And a lot of human factors, a lot of what we do is trying to con communicate that sort of ROI, like what is, yep. what is our value for, what will mm -hmm. we save you basically for, for getting in yep. the ground floor? And in this yep. kind of industry, it sounds like it's a really important place to have it because having to, you know, revamp an entire inside of, you know, a hospital or any kind of medical wing, I mean, that, that mm -hmm. requires like time that you can't really shut something down. It's not like software where you could be running something in tandem with it right or for another exactly. update i mean this is an entire like physical facility so yeah it's even more important I, in my perspective to have like human factors up front mm -hmm. so mateo one more time check here i know i know we're uh, running pretty yeah, close it's here. not it's 9 23 but i can probably quickly whip through the, la the last couple bits um here to get through wednesday at least so uh, there was uh, another session in the morning about using technology to enhance human factors and ergonomics assessment. I unfortunately missed that, but I think they were looking at um, using uh, VR, using, uh, you know, well, smart, um, like, say, accelerometer, clip-on units and, and other devices to really, I guess, augment that data that people are getting. So not doing that just traditional visual ergonomic assessment, but really, in, you know, getting technology into the process to get some of that uh, more more pure, reliable data um, back. Um, there was uh, another one on uh, dynamic positioning control system design, and it was called How a Dropped Notebook Revealed an International Trend of Potentially Fatal Incidents. So that was in technology design, and that was from an oil and gas perspective, where um, so oil and gas vessels use dynamic positioning. They've got sort of uh, thrusters on the boat, keeping them in line, using GPS. But there's a um, little control panel uh, that they showed where they could turn like the dynamic positioning off or they could turn like one of the axes on or off. And there was an issue that cropped up a, a few times that had been reported um, from various vessels that, oh, uh, a notebook had dropped onto the control panel, it disengaged one of the buttons, and then the, the vessel sort of, you know, went outside of its, its boundaries that it had uh, to be in for drilling. And there, were, there wasn't any major accidents that came out of that, but the potential for a major catastrophe as a result of that is quite large when you're drilling and if you're getting oil and other stuff. And, I mean, you've seen what happens on, on some of these oil rigs that have exploded, um, and that's a different issue again. But, uh, yeah, it was just really crazy to see, wow, okay, did anyone ever think of just putting a, a cover over the buttons that you have to slide up or something? And that all came back to the fact that the consoles were just not, really designed well to begin with, particularly on some of the older vessels where they are quite cramped and people are putting books right next to the screens and, and other stuff. So they showed some new designs where, yep, some covers were implemented over the buttons and the newer vessels where they're now using touch screens instead of um, physical push buttons. But, yeah, it was just really, really crazy to see how, you know, when you go into some of these workplaces that, people are just going to work the way they work to make it easier for themselves. They're not always going to be thinking about the, the interfaces and these uh, implications. So we really have to design out those 
potentials for errors in the system. So it's good that at least they're using some of that data to learn from that and redesign uh, these systems better. Most definitely, yeah. Uh, there was a, another good one after that. Um, it was called The Role of Ergonomists in Innovative Technology Startups. So the whole crux of that was... Um, one of the guys there who's a mechanical uh, engineer, expert witness, he's involved in human factors and ergonomics, um, he went along to uh, one of the startup uh, hackathons uh, for the resources industry and he was just basically kind of looking around the groups to see what they were designing and whether they were actually implementing uh, certain elements of human factors and ergonomics into their design process because that was actually one of the criteria from that hackathon. And so his whole, I guess take from that uh, for the audience was the fact that we need to get more human factors and ergonomics people into the tech industry and involved with startups and new products and and they shouldn't be scared thinking oh but i don't know how to code i don't know how to physically you know 3d print this thing or whatever that that is completely beside the point because it whether something's uh, you know tech in software or in, in the physical domain, whatever the case may be, it still needs to be designed with, with a human in mind. So, uh, yeah, I think he his whole thing was just trying to encourage more people to to get along to those types of events where you are mingling with a lot of different people in in uh, the tech sector, it could be the health care sector, whatever the theme these hackathons are on, and to really try and broaden their awareness of the importance of, of human factors uh, design. So that was really good that he was basically essentially, I guess, being an advocate for for human factors in, in uh, emerging tech startups, uh, which I think is great. That is excellent to hear because, I mean, I, f I feel like a lot of people let themselves kind of, and I've, I'm guilty of this too, like let that be a barrier of entry of applying for a, like a, a brand new startup job, but being scared that like you don't know CAD or you're not as engineering mm -hmm. software savvy, or you don't know how to like how to code or how to deal with 3d printing. And I mean, you'll find that in startups, or at least this was my experience was that you they'll, they're a lot more willing to let you figure things out on the job because somebody's going to have to. And if you have that expertise, like a human factors engineer or, you know, just somebody who's into ergonomics. I mean, you can bring so much into those companies that they wouldn't have otherwise, and they might not even know that's what they're what they need or what they need to be looking for. Exactly. So that that was that was a really good session, and um, then I think the well, I guess finishing up Wednesday because there's just so so much that could be talked about, but I'll, I'll definitely expand on it in Slack when I get some of these other resources. Um, so I was hanging out for the Wednesday uh, workshop, which was, again, with uh, Rochelle from Boeing. And it was um, disruptive technology, sharing global disruptive trends and technologies. So we went through a whole bunch of uh, interesting so new startups that she had encountered over the past uh, year. And I've got um, plenty of pictures of that, which I'll put up in the Slack because there's a lot of things that I was never aware of. Uh, one of them in particular was what she reiterated again about uh, sort of disruption in the travel industry with that sort of FedExing your luggage to your um, destination and, and really getting that out of the, the travel um, process. But uh, she gave us this um, booklet uh, that we got to take away. So it was about uh, their process that they use for smart um, cabin engagement. And uh, we got some areas to look at. So every table essentially had, um, I think, some trends that, that we were looking at. So there was like um, tailored experiences, new technologies, uh, differences in demographics and, and so forth. And uh, what she got us to do was to try and come up with uh, perhaps a new business uh, model for an industry or a new disruptive uh, tech for something else, uh, depending on the cards that we had on, on our tables. So it was really nice just to see how quickly uh, and, and the thinking process of having all these human factors and ergonomics people in the room, the ideas that they could come up with in about five or ten minutes, whereas when you go to a, a traditional type of hackathon where it's just full of typically a lot of tech-centric people, uh, just how stuck they get a lot of the time because they're thinking about, oh, but what about the IT integration and, you know, how this little bit of code is going to work and, and yeah, I, sort of hearing all these people in human factors, they're just like, well, look, this is you know, this is what we could create and this is what it's going to do and you don't worry about all those nitty-gritty 
tech issues because that's going to come anyway one way or another down the line but you've, you've got to get that concept out in people's mind of, of what you're going to create in the first place sure and i think i think creativity can be harnessed in a variety of different ways right we as human factors practitioners are by we our constraints are are bound by what we feel or what the user defines as an acceptable product or something that will optimize their workflow or whatever these other mm -hmm. things are. When you think about it from the tech side of things, they are looking at things like what is technically feasible and how can I be creative within those confines? And so I think in all cases, these sort of boundaries, these constraints sort of define how we are creative within those spaces. Yep, exactly. So was that everything from HFES Australia? There, uh, Mateo? Yeah, that 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 was, I guess, a, a little bit of a, a quick distillation of things because there there was just so many um, different presentations. I mean, there, there was another good one about um, redesigning uh, light rail systems, and I guess uh, you know the the sort of platforms and the way people engage with uh, the light rail way. Uh, you know, between the roads and different colour schemes and how they can really differentiate that to stop people incurring on the, the light rail um, corridors. So that was interesting to see, you know, how different uh, different people react to different things. Like they might use uh, some bushes to sort of delineate an area that you shouldn't go into because you would think that most people wouldn't want to trample a garden, for example. So little subtle design things like that to really combat the issue of, of people zipping through sort of light rail areas and, you know, uh, helping with safety. And they were talking about something, I don't know whether you guys may have ever heard about it, called uh, the DKE, which was the Dynamic Kinematic Envelope. What is that? Uh, in no. particular, so uh, in the context of, um, well, the light rail, even ra railway in general and, and trucks and cars, it's, you know, you've got the, the rail car going down the rails and obviously it's tilting slightly as it's going around a corner and, and wind forces and everything. So it's that that distance around it either side of, I guess, it's, it's maximum di uh, displacement as it oh, moves. Okay. So, so you want to make sure that uh, like cafes, shops, roads, uh, other things that are designed around that corridor aren't within that distance. Uh, uh, envelope boundary because otherwise then you know you might have a, you know on a on a high wind day or a curve or whatever the train might collide with a you know a seat or a table outside the cafe or perhaps someone walking along the sidewalk that's been built too close to the edge of the um the corridor so that was something interesting to think about in terms of you know obviously it's not just that system when, that you're designing but okay how it then interacts with everything around it in that public setting and all those little tolerances you've got to be quite aware of so that that was an interesting takeaway from that well mateo i think uh i think we're gonna let you go here so um no worries. so i just want to thank you for coming on the show and talking to us about hfes australia um You're welcome if any of our listeners went to hfes australia please let us know if you found anything interesting out there uh Please feel free to connect with Mateo on Slack. I know you're going to post all these resources. Um, uh, yep, I certainly will. <laughs> which is going to be excellent. Uh, Mateo, is there any place? Do you want to plug anything while you're on the show? Uh, let me think. Well, I, I know Ozkai was coming up, but uh, I think... Let me just get the uh, date uh, here. It is in over east. Let me grab that now. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to say, uh, if you enjoyed what you hear, uh, consider being a Patreon supporter. Stay tuned. Uh, we are going to do our normal episode right after this. Um, and like I said, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow any of our social media channels. We post news articles weekly. Um, did you get the date there, Mateo? Uh, yes. So if, funnily enough, it, it actually starts tomorrow. But for anyone that is in Melbourne or heading to Melbourne and is interested in uh, computer human interfaces... Ozkai 2018 is in Melbourne from the 5th to 7th of December. Excellent. Excellent. So I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you? You guys can always find me at Don't Panic UX across social media. Mateo Vinci, you can be found on Slack, right? Uh, yes, and uh, tw Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. Uh, Slack is probably the best uh, place for all the human factors stuff, but hey, I I'm happy to chat with anyone uh, anywhere. I'm mostly found at Matteo Vinci. Excellent. We can we will put everything in the show notes. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social, social media at Nick underscore Rome. Uh, 
Please let us know what you think about HFES Australia. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. Yes. Did it. See you guys. Bye, Mateo. Thanks for being on the show. Ciao.